light? Well, light, I think, is knowledge. Knowledge is love. Love is freedom. Freedom is energy. Energy is all. Without any doubt, without light, we can't have any images. A cinematographer is a visual psychiatrist, um, moving the audience through a movie from here to there to there to here, making them think the way you want to think, painting pictures in the dark. You have to light, you have to uh, compose, and you have to create movement. And those are the three elements of cinematography. You have to get style the hard way. You earn it by growing it internally and letting it bubble out from inside. Some of it comes from experience. Some of it comes from inspiration, and some of it just happens. Film is like a sumo wrestler. It's, you know, sometimes you get thrown out of the ring by it, and sometimes you win. I think it's really important to really delve deep into it and really become part of your subconscious and your psyche to really develop an idea for how you visually want to represent a story. We have the ability to work in all genres and uh, each film should have its own style. I think it was the fascination initially with the technology and then how mastering that technology in the service of art made cinematography such a unique thing that just kept me in it to this day. My name is Ramey Eddie Farrison. Russ Alsabrook. Howard Anderson. I'm Howard Anderson the third. Peter Anderson. My name is Michael Ballhaus. Dion Beebe. I'm Bill Bennett. Gabriel Beristein, and I'm a cinematographer. Um, I'm Mexican, British educated, and American improved. Larry Bridges. Jonathan Brown. I'm Steve Burem, I'm a cinematographer. Bill Butler. Bobby Byrne. Russell Carpenter. James Chrysanthus. Peter Collister. Jack Cooperman. Erickson Kaur. I'm Richard Crudo. I'm Dean Cundy. Oliver Curtis. I'm Alan Davio, and I'm a cinematographer. Roger Deakins. Peter Deming. Caleb Deschanel. I'm Ron Dexter. Bill Bill. George Spiro Dibi. Ernest Dickerson. Uh, I'm Richard Edlin. John Fowler. I'm Don Fonderoy. Steve Fearberg. William A. Fraker. My name is Michael Goy. Stephen Goldblatt. My name is Jack Green. Adam Greenberg. Robbie Greenberg, cinematographer. My name is Henner Hoffman. Ernie Holzman. My name is Gil Hubbs. I'm Judy Irola. Mark Irwin. Levy Isaacs. Johnny Jensen. I'm Victor J. Kemper. Francis Kenny. Richard Klein. Fred Konekamp. My name is Laszlo Kovacs. Laszlo Kovac. I'm Ellen Kuras, ASC. I'm uh, Jacek Laskus. I am Andrew Laszlo. I am Denis Lenoir. Matt Leonetti. Peter Levy. Matthew Libatique. I'm Stephen Lighthill. Carl Walter Lindenlaub. Bruce Logan. Julian McCott. Isidore Mankowski, ASC. Chris Manley. Stephen Mason. I'm Clark Mathis. Don McQuaig. Rob McLaughlin. Chuck Minsky. Donald M. Morgan. Kramer Morgenthau. David Mullen. Fred Murphy. My name is Hiro Narita. I'm Michael Negrin. My name is Saul Negrin. Darren Okada. I'm Woody Omens. I'm Daniel Perrault. Fern Perlstein. Wally Pfister. Bill Pope. Stephen Poster. Bob Primes. Tony Richmond. I'm a cinematographer. My name is Owen Roisman. Pete Romano. I'm Paul Ryan. I'm Nancy Schreiber. My name's John Schwartzman. My name's John Seal. Dean Semler. I I'm Michael Sarazen from New Zealand. Stephen Shaw. I'm Newton Thomas Siegel, and on my best days, I'm a cinematographer. Bradley Six. Dante Spinotti. I'm Uli Steiger. My name is Tom Stern. My name is Vittorio Soraro. I'm a cinematographer. I'm not a director of photography. Uh, Rodney Taylor. I'm John Toro. I'm a cinematographer. Case Van Ouster. I'm Amy Vinson. My name is Haskell Wexler. Gordon Willis. Ralph Woolsey. Robert Yeoman. I'm Bill Mozigmund. I'm a cinematographer. Invariably, two questions come up. And the first question, somebody uh, will ask, how did you, meaning me, start in the film business? When I was a kid, I was, I was mad about movies, but 
it was a long time. It was my, I suppose my career, my life just sort of gradually sort of gradually grew into my dreams, really, you know? I became a cinematographer because at 14, uh, after being interested in photography for about four years, I met a cinematographer, and the day I met him, I decided that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I got interested when I first saw a demonstration of color television, and I had gone to movies and had black and white television, but when I saw color, I said, I have to find out how they do this. Even though in those days you really had no hope of ever becoming anyone in the movie business unless you were somehow connected to somebody in the business. Well, my father was a cinematographer. I was born into it. My dad was an animation cameraman. I was in a family business. My father, my uncle, and my grandfather, and all of the relatives that I can remember on my father's side were barbers. My father was a makeup artist at Warner Brothers in Brooklyn during the Depression. So I was always around, hanging around, hanging around, and I decided I wanted to be an actor early on when I was a kid. Lucky for me, I changed my mind. I became a cinematographer because of the influence of my grandmother. And uh, she was a school teacher in Mazatlan, Mexico. Uh, when I, I was in Mexico, being, being from a family of actors and filmmakers. My aunt, who, who along with my mother, were both extras. And uh, 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 my aunt said, Billy, you're going to go to school and you're going to become a cinematographer. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, they're the most respected people on the set. They all wear ties. <laughs> and it's a great profession. My dad always contended it was a great business to fall back on if you had another opportunity. Little did I know I spent seven years cutting hair waiting for an opportunity. <laughs> my father was head of the portrait gallery at Warner's. My mother had been an art dealer. My father was a painter and sculptor, so uh, if I went to become a lawyer or a doctor, I think I would have been disowned. I could never draw or paint or do anything like that. I picked this camera up and I could paint. Now this is back in, Minas in Minnesota. I was born and raised in Chicago. I was born in Hungary. Sydney, Australia. Born and raised in Los Angeles. I grew up in Mexico. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm originally from Poland. This was Eau Claire, Wisconsin. You know, I come from an area of Italy where, which is very far away from any uh, Movie industry. We go back uh, actually uh, to Jerusalem. When I started, I built a tent and I start pick up cartoons, splice them together. I love film because it's all I've ever done really. It's all I've ever done. Um, from right from when I left school at 15, um, I joined uh, I joined Pathé News. I uh, started in television when I was 16 as a props boy. I was a, a messenger boy running up and down Water Street with cans of film. I was lucky that my father has a, a beautiful dream. He was a projectionist in a very big company in Italy in the 50s, Lux Film. Uh, Lux Film. And uh, he was dreaming probably to be part of the image that he was screening. Uh, so he put uh, uh, his dream on me. When I was a kid, I, uh, I, I liked still photography, loved it. I thought for a while I wanted to be a photographer for Life magazine, like Gene Smith, who was one of my, her my childhood heroes. And the year I, I was a senior in high school, life folded. And I ended up starting to go to university because of not knowing any better and not daring to apply to film school. And then when I went to college, I kind of was trying to decide, should I go into filmmaking, which seemed like jumping off a cliff if you were in Detroit. In college, I was a lighting designer. I was the AV guy. I was a town projectionist. I was also the school projectionist every school that I went to. I was in school studying mathematics and physics. I, I studied engineering in college. I'm educated as a mechanical engineer in Copenhagen, Denmark. I was studying English literature at Hofstra University and I needed six credits to graduate and I took a film course. Well, my first love really was journalism. I began studying architecture in addition to film studies. I was an architecture student and uh, I was faced with a difficult model I, which I couldn't build, so I decided to make an animated film. But I remember when I was cutting it together between two very old VCRs, and I, 30 minutes had passed, and I was getting hungry, and I looked up, and actually six hours had passed. And I realized, hmm, I never, I never really lost track of time doing calculus. I went to Johns Hopkins as an undergraduate to become a physician. First, I was a movie buff, like uh, watching 500 films a year at the Cinematheque. And the films, I mean, projected, uh, not tapes at the time. And, uh, of course, my studies, uh, I was studying medic medicine at the time, medical studies. 
But of course, I was such a failure. Uh, so I had to do something else. And uh, one day, went to see a movie, Akira Kurosawa's Ron. And I was pretty blown away. I thought, if that's something you can do, I want to do it. It seemed like film was closer to dreams than uh, the rest of the artwork I was doing. The next big influence would probably be Days of Heaven. This happened when I was in college. At the end of high school, I was, happened to be, I was in a library, and I was walking through the stacks, and a, a book of a red cover caught my eye. And it was called The Work of the Motion Picture Cameraman by Freddie Young, BSC. And uh, I said, oh, what's, what's a motion picture cameraman? In film school, I met a young gentleman by the name of Spike Lee, and I shot all of his uh, student projects uh, in the second and third years. I didn't go to film school. I uh, worked on a lot of, uh, lot of student films. I came out of film school and then didn't work for a lot of years. I was painting the first year out of art school. I wanted to be a painter at one time. As much as I loved painting, I couldn't, I couldn't get them to move. They were like, and I just trying to get them to move. And the only way I could do that was to start shooting little films. I had a dream. Uh, I dreamt uh, of Gandhi and a spinning wheel and the uh, Life magazine pictures that Margaret Bourke White had shot. And in the dream, they animated. Not only did the spinning wheel move, but the camera moves around it. And I took that as a sign that maybe it was time I uh, add the dimension of motion to, to my still photography. As a designer, uh, or, or as, as, a, as an illustrator, I would be dealing with single image, and it, it became increasingly frustrating just to be looking at a single image for a long time and, and, and begin to, began to think of sequence of images to tell, tell stories. I was a secretary in the, um, at KQED, and um, I watch the people who come out of the, the film department every day carrying silver cases and wearing Levi's and I didn't want to wear nylons anymore and I stand, truly and I started working with the film, film department on the weekends. Started actually as a stagehand. I started off as a um, documentary still photographer. I started as an underwater camera in the US Navy. And I was working as a waiter. I started off as an animator. When I graduated college I arrived here in Los Angeles and sought work and initially couldn't get the time of day from anyone. When I moved to New York and answered an ad in the Village Voice, which got me onto a real movie. I had a friend that was working on a low-budget horror film in uh, uh, South Carolina, and I went down there and worked as a PA. Started right from the bottom. I was a PA, I was a, uh, an assistant to the lowest assistant. I did everything from sweeping the floor to projecting the film. When I started in the business, the only equipment I was trusted with was a broom. When I was 26 years old, I finished film school in Hungary. I went to film school in Hungary. And the revolution came in 1956. Against the uh, Russians, uh, with my friend Wilmer Zygmunt, we covered. All the cinematographers in, in, in during the revolution, we were shooting footage, documentary footage. We shot about 30,000 feet of film. And we had a meeting, secret meeting, that, that some people will have to volunteered to go to the West and take the footage out. We smuggled it out. And uh, we couldn't, obviously, we couldn't go back. And I volunteered, actually, because I, I had the reason to go. As long as we figured we are here in the West, this was still in Germany, I mean, Austria, Vienna, uh, might as well, let's go to Hollywood. Of course, that was easy to say, but, it, but in reality, actually, if you don't know the language, you don't know anybody, and you, you, you go and visit all the Hungarians who were in, in the business in those days, you know, like Joe Pasternak, Jaja Gabor, and you can name all of them. And, and then we, we thought that maybe that can help us to get into the film business, but it didn't work that way, actually, you know. They, they, they said that first you have to show what you can do, and then we can help you. And I didn't realize if once we showed what we can do, we didn't need that help anymore. I, I couldn't get past secretaries. At one point, I sent out resumes hand-printed on sandpaper, just so they would remember it, you know? I, I sent the resumes written on shirt cardboard so they couldn't crumple it up and toss it in the wastebasket. My family wanted to know, well, what are you gonna do with your life now? And they had some 
um, some business ideas, some things that I should do to uh, make something of myself. My father always would say to me when I was first starting out, well, why don't you join CBS or why don't you get a real job as, you know, a cameraman on a news station? Became a news cameraman with a 16mm Bell & Howe, black and white. Uh, we used to take great pride in shooting three news stories in 100 feet of film. Rupert Murdoch's channel, we'd save money. And I managed to get into the government station, which is the Australian Broadcasting Commission. And there was quite a good little uh, group of uh, features type cameramen there from the early days. A lot of them were ex-World War II combat cameramen. So you had this amazing crossover between fairly sophisticated uh, features cameramen and rough and tumble alcoholic combat cameramen. And so it was a good learning process. You, you didn't know who you'd be going out with to assist them. Um, but you'd e either end up, you know, doing a lovely job of something or totally drunk. I had a couple of guys live next door to me and they asked me if I wanted a job and I got a job at a television station. You know, pushing dollies and the boom and all of that stuff. And it seemed like the coolest guys on the set were around the camera. I started in 1943. Uh, and I, st I worked eight years as an assistant cameraman. I showed up first day of work with a paper bag and a tape measure. I was never an assistant. Uh, I was never an operator, actually, even. Yeah, loaded mags and slapped slates for a long time. Cleaned tripods and cleaned up the equipment, the cases, and, and drove the gear from place to place. Anything good that ever happened to me happened because of someone else giving me an opportunity. The thing about the business is the generosity of people. So um, I had a wonderful learning experiences and working relationships with uh, Owen Roisman taught me to see in a tenth of a stop. You know, I, I always say when I'm teaching students anything is cinematography is an art form, but at the same time it's a craft. And it's a, definitely a combination of the two. One of my mentors at Dartmouth was Andy Laszlo. He was invited to talk about half an hour to our, to our class on cinematography, and two days later he was still talking. So Andy was a, a great mentor and a great inspiration and uh, probably one of the reasons why I really wanted to get into the business. You have to be totally, absolutely committed to it. You have to, it has to become religion. You have to eat it, sleep it, talk it, and go after every opportunity there is to um, get yourself established. And in the process, I ran into this wonderful man who eventually became my mentor, Ron Dexter. And I would say Ron Dexter was an inspiration to so many of us. I taught all along. Once I knew something, I'd share whatever I knew. He would have occasional symposiums where he would talk about what he was doing and show uh, the experiments that he was making. And then he'd have us all bring in pieces of film, what we were shooting, and have group discussions. I was lucky that the gaffer really took an interest in my learning electricity and light. My mentor in uh, Hollywood is uh, the cinematographer Vilmos Zygmunt. I had the opportunity to work with Vittorio here in Los Angeles, and I would pick up Mr. Storaro at the, uh, at the uh, hotel in Sunset every morning, and we would drive to, I'd drive him to work. And I would ask him a question about uh, maybe composition or a certain scene we were doing today, and then I would get a 30 or 40 minute lecture I felt like a doctorate on composition or color or Yugoslavian primitive art or whatever it was that was his inspiration for that, for that film. So when I was young and I was mentoring, it was a really unique opportunity to get to spend time with these people and really sort of understand their thought process. I mean, I can remember with Vittorio bringing my light meter and a sketchbook around and he used to just berate me. And he'd say, that's not what it's about. It's, you know, it's from the heart. It's about the emotion. And uh, I thought to myself, yeah, yeah, that's all good and well. You're Vittorio Storaro. I was always was Vittorio Storaro, even at my beginning. When I started, I was, nobody knew me, nobody, um, you know, uh, saw myself compared to what I did before. Um, I think that you should be always yourself. Uh, from when you start, from when you are in the journey, or when you think you reach one specific place. That's part of your personality, part of your way of thinking, part of your of way of doing. Um, many times, um, yes, young cinematographer telling me, you can do that, or maybe refuse a project, or maybe do uh, one selection in your life, because you are now this kind of person. 
I always did that. I mean, uh, I remember that on the first film, Giovinizza, Giovinizza, and I was doing um, tests uh, uh, for actors. And we were like more or less your crew, a small crew. We were working in a very simple way and um, just trying to understand what the movie is supposed to look like. And uh, so now I find myself uncomfortable for what the director asked me to do. And I was forced to do it. And at the end of the day, I was 28. I say to him, goodbye. I don't think I come back tomorrow because I don't think you need me. You need some, someone to just put one light, just let you see whoever's in front of you, not in a particular way that you want to see this person. So I don't think I come back tomorrow. I was married that, um, two years before. We already have one daughter, and my wife was expecting a child, and we had only $50 in bank. And I say no. No is a very important word, uh, very important. Yes is not a good word all the time, you know. I mean, it doesn't get you more work. In fact, no gets you more work than yes, because anything works while you're shooting it. Nothing works in the screening room if it's no good. So what they said the day before, they can't remember when they get in the screening room. So if you said no to something bad and it turns out to be right in the screening room, they forget about the no the day before. But they never forget about the yes if it's no good. And this was wonderful. And I was Vittorio Storaro then on my first film. I believe a cinematographer should always be interpreting, should never be recording, but adding their point of view, their interpretation to anything. And in order to interpret, uh, you have to make a commentary, you have to say something about it, either with light and dark or color, composition or textures or, 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 or whatever. Do you shoot it in a gritty, grainy, handheld way or do you do it in a very beautifully lit way with glidy tracks? You have to make a decision. So it's not always as obvious what style you would want to use to make the film. When you do a scene, you ask yourself, what do you want the audience to think or feel at the end of this scene that they didn't at the beginning of the scene? So what path do we take that will evoke that emotional response by the end of the scene? Style. Yeah, everybody wants a story about style, you know, how you get the formula. Well, there is no formula because style comes out of you. I mean, people like to hear that you did this, you did that. But really, the reason you did it is for something that you were thinking. And actually, it comes out of your life, what you've been exposed to, who you are, what you think. And that's what ends up on the screen. And style basically uh, comes out of conceiving, designing, uh, creating a, a visual approach to a particular story. Style is an individual artist's uh, own take on things. And it's not a coat of paint, it's not a suit that you can just put on, it's not a coat of paint you can just put on a building, it's not surface. I like to think that my style is, is based on the translation of the material, and I think the most important thing is the, the narrative, and our job is to, is to take that narrative and translate it into, into imagery. The style of the picture and the look of the picture uh, it starts with the written word. First you read the script. Start with the story. It's always, always, always about the story. The script. Obviously it starts with the script. The story. The material. Uh, the written word. Starts with the script. You've got to know the script. That's number one. You read the script and you try to figure out what this movie's going to look like. I mean, if I get a script, I really like to read it at least ten times. When you first read a script, you have no idea who the cast is, what the location is, what the sets are like, what the wardrobe is. But you have a vision, you, you come up with pictures, you read it in pictures. I try to read it for just the words and the feeling of it. Um, I end up pre-visualizing it, no matter how hard I try not to. You first you read the script, and maybe you already have some ideas how it should look. But the basic thing is that uh, you sit down with the director and uh, start to talk about the movie. First, when I read a script, I never, almost never have any ideas or uh, images. I'm trying to just to read to see if I would like to see it as a story at all. And also because I, probably because I'm, I don't want to, maybe it's wrong, I don't know, but maybe I don't want to come to the meeting and meet the director and say, oh, I see very strong colors. And the director say, well, uh, I see it black and white. Uh, <laughs> so I guess for this reason, I restrain myself to have any idea 
uh, in the beginning. And not only the first meeting, but also in the first weeks where I see my job I like trying to be more like a sponge and to try to get uh, any information I can get. I very often don't really know. I have my ideas and then, you know, I let it, I listen a lot and I just walk through it and pretend I know. I don't have a clue. And because it sort of comes to it, I really do believe every film that I've done has sort of found its own style somehow. Basically, you have, a, you have a great idea, or you have an idea what you want this picture, your picture to look like. I call it yours because you're working on it. Uh, and you, you talk with your director, and it's usually you and the director who, who, who find a bond, who, who form a marriage, and that's what it's all about. And when you go to work with a director, I think you have to find out what is inside his or her head. I'd like to break down the screenplay with the director, scene for scene act by act. Discuss things back and forth until we know it's sort of the, the right way to do it. And we'll bash it back and forth and, and we'll keep landing on the same sort of thing. And I think the, the photography falls into place on that. If we're talking about, you know, how to shoot something or what the mood is or how important something is. I don't think the director and I discussed anything about the style of the film. The style kind of grew out of itself as we work together. They are cinematographers who are cinematographer painters, cinematographer engineers, cinematographer editors. I believe that I'm a bit of a cinematographer writer in as much as I try to penetrate the story really well and I try to find a way in which my lighting or my camera work becomes a character within the story. That's why it's called Deshima Musa because it's nourishing itself from the other nine muses from literature, from painting, from dancing, from philosophy, from sculpture, from architecture. Uh, only when you are, cinema is really today the, the, an art form, they combine all the different art forms. And this, I think, is one of the things of how a style evolves for a picture, is that you look at films together, you look at, at, at still photographs, you look at paintings. In a sense, painters and cinematographers, it's, they're cut from the same genetic strain. I mean, it's, they're special. Every cinematographer would love to, to shoot, you know, from sunrise for about two hours and then stop when the light's no good in the middle of the day, and then at the end of the day, shoot at the end of the day. That's like painters. Painters used to go out really early in the morning and capture all their effects. And I mean, people said, well, why, you know, why did Constable look, look better than Turner? And the answer always was Constable got up earlier in the morning. When I think of painters that I would like to make honorary members of the ASC, I would, in a second, write a letter to the membership committee for Monet. Because Monet taught me a great deal about color latitude and about atmosphere. I'm always resourcing uh, visuals, sometimes music, but usually visuals from all the other arts and, and bringing them together in what I call my brain book, which, which is, oh, before we start shooting, sometimes becomes one or two volumes of, of, of photographs, of drawings, of diagrams, of thoughts that I have about the look of a picture. The idea being that, that usually by the fourth and sometimes by the sixth week of a production, everybody's brain dead, everybody's exhausted. And so having done that work in pre-production, in a coherent state, I have a, a bottom line of quality that, uh, <laughs> that, a safety net that I can descend to by looking into that book, and I'll always have that. And then everything else that I bring is, is icing on the cake. What I bring to the style of a particular movie is that initial intuitive impulse of how a movie should feel and the tone. Style, um, though I think is so much, besides the material, is so much determined by the cinematographer's life experiences and the, and the things that personally move the, the artist, the cinematographer. When you have an idea, it's usually an idea of you've seen it, you've heard it, or you experienced it. When I shoot movie, even prep, later in prep, close to shooting, I wake up at night, two o'clock, three o'clock at night, with thoughts. 
with good ideas. So the best ideas coming to 30 at night. Ideally, you bring your life experience to the process of making that movie at its best so that you connect to it in the way that you want your audience to. It has to do with the art you see, the photographs, the, the paintings and so on, the images on the street sometimes, the light, the way it falls in certain places on buildings and so on. Everything you've learned influences what you do. Raoul Coutard, a wonderful French cameraman, talked about working with Godard, and he said, you don't know who this gentleman that walked through the door, what, what is in his mind, but the, the left side of the frame he's striving for came from a, a Jean Renoir silent film of the 20s, and the right side is a poster he saw in the Metro that morning. And, I mean, literally you find out what, what is, is creating the images in the director's head and how you translate those onto film. But I think when you, you're constantly looking for new ways to do things, because... Uh, you just don't want to be telling each story the same way that you told the last. So improvisation and, and uh, imagination is really important. I really like to research things, have a clear idea of what I'm doing, but then I also like to respond to what happens, you know, at the moment. I mean, uh, an actor can come in and their performance can so op overpower something that you suddenly realize that what you imagined was an actor in, you know, uh, lost in a setting is suddenly a big close-up because the performance is so extraordinary. No, I think you could always arrive on a set or on a scene and sort of feel how it should be done. And I think the doc... I, I like in, even in shooting features now, if it looks good the way it is and it's going to photograph good the way it is, don't change it. Don't start changing it. There's just so many factors along the way that affect you. And you, you know, I mean, it's to some extent, it's, it's like you know, learning everything you can and being well rehearsed, but then when it really comes down to it, it's like jazz in the sense that you respond to the things and you ebb and flow with everything as it, as it evolves on the set on the day. As a musician will find a force in them that they can't really explain when they play or when they sing. So, so you can as a photographer and so you can as a cinematographer. There is a there's an instinct. I think that the uh, visualization for me always came at the production meetings and the, the headbanging that I would do with the director and the production designer. Your communication with your production designer is so important because the production designer and the cinematographer are there working with the director to find that look, to find the style of a film. The production designer is also a very key person for me. I spend a lot of time in the art department talking about color, uh, practical lighting, if they can build that into the set. They've generally been on the film earlier than uh, I would get there. They might have done all the surveys through foreign countries or they've already started to design sometimes. In fact, most times they've started to build sets. So they're way ahead of you and, and they've had the long talks with the director as to, to how the director wants that scene in that uh, particular location uh, to play. And on North Fork, we wanted an almost black and white feeling. And one of the keys was to get nothing in color in the frame. So our department on that film actually put uh, gray paint in the ketchup bottles in our diner scenes. We covered all the surfaces of the counters with gray contact paper. We even sewed a black and white American flag that was blowing in the wind. And I actually got a call back from the lab asking me how I managed to get the color out of the American flag when I told them it was a black and white American flag against the blue sky. So. A lot, of can, a lot can be done in camera, in front of the camera, by coordinating things with art department. The key meeting was the first meeting we had with the production designer. I had read the script, I met, met Wayne and the designer. We sat in a room, we just looked at photo books, and I brought similar photo books than the production designer had brought in already, and all the win walls were pasted with these pictures. And it was William Eggleston, and, and uh, I had Maya Rovitz and things like that. And it was uh, all about color and, and, and how we see the South, because the movie takes place in the South. Uh, and from that, my concept evolved. I mean, it, it was a great starting point, and it, it was always something. I, I took a couple of pictures out of the books and, and always stuck them on my wall in the hotel. That was my, my key thing. That's the first thing you're afraid of as a cinematographer. You can shoot good pictures individually, but, you know, what makes you think that as a whole is going to fall together into this, this thing that you meant to be? A movie, you spend, you come up with a look, and then you spend three months doing that, one look, and then a year later you see how it worked when it's all cut together. 
Whereas in a commercial music video, you, you try something for a day, you see it two days later, and you go, okay, okay, that was good, now let's try this. And so you can, you can grow really quickly. I think commercials have always sort of been the area that um, can allow us to sort of experiment. In commercials, it's all about the cinematography. That and the story is what grabs the people in the first five seconds. You've got 30 seconds to tell a story. I learned a lot about shooting via commercials because there was so much technique in commercials and so much gear and so much stuff that you could draw on to learn things that I learned a lot. And it was a great place to begin a career in cinematography because we were studying for myself. I studied and learned quite a bit of different technique and was always trying to look for the new thing. So it gave me um, a broad quiver of um, things to experiment with. The things I've stumbled onto in terms of a look uh, has come out of uh, ignorance and in naivete and making like horrible mistakes and then going, oh, actually that kind of looks kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And then if you're smart or, or at least if you're paying attention, you let great accidents happen. I love what Connie Hall used to call happy accidents. You know, you're in a set and suddenly the light starts slashing through a window. And even, even if you don't use that natural light, you suddenly think, no, that's it, I didn't think of that. So you maybe cut that light off and put a lamp to do exactly the same thing so you can have consistency. All cinematographers take credit for wonderful, happy accidents along the way. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly one of them where, you know, the, the clouds come in and, you know, the light is amazing for a brief period of time or suddenly the clouds are blowing over. I'm just looking at this little dapple of light on my shoulder here and reminds me of Conrad Hall who was the master of the found accident and capitalizer, or if you, there is such a word, a man who capitalizes on those discoveries, always awake for them. Conrad Hall was great on this. He was great on this. He said, you know, he sometimes he really wanted his films to look ugly to, 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 to capture something that we don't really, that we normally shy away from in, in making movies. You know, ugliness can have a certain beauty as well. It's a strange sort of dichotomy going on there, really. It's symbiotic, and it really works hand in hand. I mean, there's certain kind of film is definitely affected by the tone of a film, the light, the shadows, the color, how, how the camera moves, when it moves, the moment that an actor turns its head and you just pan slightly to the left to just catch that gaze and to frame it in a certain way. That, I think, evokes a certain kind of emotion. There's a spirit in each cinematographer's work that's not comparable to any others. Uh, you see the techniques appear to be the same. You see the same approaches in lighting. You see what you can do with the materials at hand. But there, there's always an ineffable quality in the actual film when it comes out of processing or onto the Avid that is almost indescribable. There is a definable style that's going through most of my movies. I mean, it's applied differently. I mean, I do a lot of the same things, but it's applied differently. And uh, I mean, I don't mind saying that. It's, it's, you know, and I don't, the trick is to integrate your visual decisions with the movie, with the story. And uh, you, you can have both. I mean, you can have a good movie with good visuals. I mean, that's the best movie. You know, good content, good visual structure. You know, I think it's very important that the style of the film be as transparent as possible. Now, I'm saying that having done movies like The Rock, Armageddon and Pearl Harbor, which are almost all style, but that's what really those movies were about. Because in those cases, if you ever stopped long enough to figure out that an oil driller was on an asteroid and he was going to blow it up with a nuclear bomb, you probably would have left the theater. So the idea was to keep, the, to keep it visual and to, to make it exciting for an audience. And that, and that was the goal of a picture like that, and we knew it going in. I'm not demeaning the work. It was just of we were, we were meeting a different set of, of needs for a picture like that than, than I was on a picture like Seabiscuit where it was really very emotional and very moving and I didn't want um, my work to get in the way of the story. The Matrix was uh, uh, influenced almost entirely by the light in Paris, believe it or not, uh, as interpreted by filmmakers in the, in the 60s. So after the discovery of this great emotion like Blue in Paris, in The Conformist, I felt that uh, 
I need to discover even deeper the, the possibility of this vibration the, or this color. So many other movies that I've done after The Conformist, several one, I tried to use uh, this color to investigate in the possibility of this color. Till they get in, in, a, in a Last Tango in Paris. And I remember that I was going to see Bernardo every weekend in Paris. And I was so astonished about uh, uh, the chance that Paris, a city in winter, have all the lights on, was uh, like a city light. And the artificial light, when it's on during the daytime, as a kind of conflict between the artificial energy and the natural energy, it was giving me the feeling totally different, almost opposite, complementary of the blue of the, last, of the conformist, and orange, like the warm feeling, the kind of womb of the mother of the city of Paris that was embracing herself. When I was thinking about The Godfather, both one and two at the time, I, it was about 20 minutes before we started the movie that I finally decided what it should look like. And um, the feeling of how a film should look really comes out of you. And I can't tell you why I decided that. I said, well, it's, it should be kind of dirty and street and should be brassy yellow. And if somebody said, why did you decide that? I would have to say, I have no idea. I, it felt like it should be that way. I almost wonder if The Godfather would look the way it does if somebody had sat on the set with a video monitor and looked at what was going to come out on the screen. They would, everybody would have chickened out, and that's a problem. I think there were people that felt that way, and there were other people that felt, God almighty, I don't want to hire him. Look what will happen, so <laughs> it was. Yeah, I got, uh, for Gangs of New York, um, I got influenced a little by Rembrandt, I must say, because Marty gave me a book about Rembrandt, which is about the best book that came out about Rembrandt. And his way of shadows and darkness and people being in the shade and people being in the bright light, also the simplicity of the, of the lighting was um, influential on the way I tried to light uh, Gangs of New York. Well, St. Elmo's Fire, because that was, a, that was an ensemble picture. You had five or six kids, and there was a lot of rapid-fire dialogue. And I thought it would be more interesting to always have it in a group. So we shot it in scope, so you could fit five people across the frame. Everybody would be, you know, like a waist figure, so you'd see them very well. And they all of them were good actors. It was good dialogue, and they could just spit that stuff out like crazy. I think it's more interesting to see uh, actors take their pacing off of each other than have it forced by the cutting. The luminance, we decided that it has, has to have a very real look. If it was actually more real than reality, that's why we decided to, to, to shoot the movie sharp, but we, we decided to, to do desaturation of, uh, of, of images. I'd say the New York look probably was, I think is one of the things that I started with the French Connection, which was uh, more of a realistic quality, more of a little low-key, grainy, dingy quality to it. Not documentary totally, but verging on the uh, on the edge of it there are certain definite uh, uh, appearances that when you shoot in new york you do get a different kind of a look all told we worked in the streets we worked at night and we just had them get those pictures and we had very little lighting to, with which to do it but at that time what it was was single source no fill light soft light kind of a look that came from still photography basically the buildings are very dense the population density is very big and you've got high buildings, so you've got a lot of shadow and contrasty light. That's, I think, another distinction about New York is people walk in and out of very hot, bright, sourcey light and then into very deep shadows. And there's one thing I've always noticed I find interesting is multiple reflections in New York because as the sun kicks off of a variety of, of uh, glass-windowed buildings, you can have uh, this very artificial light. You don't have to do much to make it look good. You know, you don't have to build anything visually to make New York interesting. Again, you know, you choose to shoot this, you choose to shoot that. You put them together and you've got a good New York. When we talk about style, we also talk about personal uh, improvising with, to f fit the vision that we're thinking of within the equipment and the time we've got. Well, sometimes style comes out of uh, pure necessity. 
or desperation. Case in point in the 60s and 70s with the new lightweight cameras, you had directors who wanted to take those cameras on the road, stick them in cars, put them in bathrooms. And so as technology evolves and we have equipment that's lighter, easier to shoot with, faster, you're going to see experimental shooting with it of people who want to take it to the edge and see what it's capable of. There is a story behind Easy Rider. There's about three, four, five years until we got to that point, you know, we were very fluid in making low budget films and we knew how to do it. We knew how to do it, do a movie, just uh, enough equipment, put it into a station wagon. And, <clears throat> and that was it. We didn't need trucks. We didn't need generators. We couldn't even think of it. We were always dreaming about, you know, all this great equipment we could have. And, uh, but, you know, we made this work for us. We made the stories, you know, of fit what we can do in the same way the equipment fit the stories also. Let's take it back to the Cinemobile, the equipment that went into this truck. It was a Ford Econoline truck, very, very small. Uh, we didn't have Mitchell cameras. We had blimped airflexes, which were smaller. We used Colortran lamps, which was all quartz lights, no Fresnels on them. So uh, it was a hard light that you couldn't cut with flags because it didn't have the lens in front. So you bounce the lights instead. So, you know, a style evolved from having very little equipment and uh, by necessity, basically. If you can think of a quick way of doing it, the cheap way, that still works, uh, it, it saves a lot of money and time. And you're not scared of doing it. The Black Stallion is really very much, really came out of the style of really educational documentary films that both Carol Ballard and I really came out of because we both had worked together on some educational films. And, you know, what Carol really does, you know, his directing style is to set up a scene as if it's really happening and then you photograph it as if you were making a documentary of that scene. Chasing the situations in a documentary allows you to to develop a style in camera. As a documentary filmmaker, you're hyper aware of the location, where you are, because that's all you have, have to work with. The documentaries I did were sort of very kind of verite, you know, we would go, you know, some, you know, film a tribe in Africa or film a war zone, and you kind of make up the movie, the, make up the film and what you were trying to say, or as, almost as a journalist exploring the subject. But often documentaries are emulated by f f fiction films, and, um, and now you find documentaries um, doing recreations and, <clears throat> and creating their own fictional sequences within a documentary. So I think both schools inform each other. If you worked on a lot of documentaries, you already know how people walk. You know how they talk. You know that when they're making dinner, they're not standing there looking at each other. One's over here, one's over here. They're all speaking over their shoulders. Sometimes there's silence. It's a great training ground for shooting narratives and seeing what is available light you know where does the light come from what makes a Japanese restaurant beautiful and a Chinese restaurant not quite so pretty <laughs> the lighting <laughs> Hollywood I think I found out has always had a school of uh, keeping in touch with an audience and this has happened not only uh, and, and this has carried itself also into the language of filmmaking um, the shots are made in a way that uh, they don't make the movies low, you know, they, they, you go from cut to cut as opposed to having a slower kind of pace generally used in European pictures. I shot Uprising, uh, which was a miniseries for NBC three years ago, three or four years ago. And uh, when it was sh sh uh, shown here, uh, people were thinking that it was very European in, the, in my work. You know, cold colors, contrast. Contrast, I'm not sure, such desaturated tones and all that. And then I, I screened it uh, for my colleagues at the AFC in Paris. Uh, and they, for them, it was so Hollywood. <laughs> so I was thinking, OK, I'm in the, I'm in the middle of the ocean uh, with really one foot in. Uh, and after X years here, I am, you know, not completely American and not anymore completely European.
I think Americans are getting very brave with their style. I think the thing about European films is that you don't have studios leaning down so heavily on you and execs worrying about their job and worrying about which way it should be made. So the filmmakers, they trust the filmmakers to make a good job. I never did anything that to be different. I just did it because I liked it. And it kind of caused a riot a couple of times at certain studios, um, and they were very upset. But I didn't. I said, wow, this is it, and continued. Well, that helped other people do things possibly, in the, but a long time. It took them a long time before they would shoot with one light or no light or against a window or this or that. But it's, it's something that I enjoy doing. I never think about it. I just think about applying it, but I never think about, I can't do this or I can't, you know, I don't. We can put the light over here. We can put here. We can put here. We can put here. We can put just in front or in the back. Change completely. And the way that any cinematographer is uh, using this kind of light can tell really a story can write with light you walk on a set it's absolutely black absolutely black and you strike your first light for what you're going to do and that becomes your first brush stroke and then you add other brush strokes all the way through add different lights and so forth like that until you come up with your complete picture and then you look at it and say okay let's do it when i walk into a dark stage usually i turn on one light and I've usually, this light hopefully has been there before I put it there earlier, because I hopefully know where the light's coming from in the scene. But, uh, and then I decide, what, what does that look like? And that's theoretically the light that's coming in the window, or the light that's coming from the main lamp in the room, or something. And I'll start with that. And the other lights also should be in place, and then I'll turn them on. I like, I don't turn on all the lights at once. Usually I turn them on one at a time and then I start turning them off again. Usually when I show up on a set and uh, get ready to shoot, I've already lit the set in my head. I mean, my favorite thing in, in using light, for instance, I like relativity. I like light to dark, you know, big to small. I mean, my favorite kind of thing is you have somebody standing by a window talking to somebody who's standing in the corner, and uh, someone standing in the corner is in the dark. You know, so you're cutting from this guy at the window talking to this girl who's standing in the corner in the dark. I mean, there are three things that lighting has to do. Uh, it has to provide for sufficient illumination to record the image on film. Um, it has to make up for the difference in contrast between our eye and the film. And it has to enhance the illusion of third dimension in a two-dimensional medium. Okay, well, that's what it has to do. What it can do... It can affect you emotionally. It can help tell the story. Um, you have to know what story you're telling before you even start to think about how you light it. And you have to think about whether you want the audience to see everything clearly or whether you want to hold it back a bit from the audience, whether you want to throw the actors into a little bit of shadow. Not adding, but taking away is better, always. You know. But, I don't know, it's like somebody, somebody's not working, they throw another sandbag in the boat because it's listing, you know, and they keep throwing sandbag and apparently the whole boat sinks, you know. You don't, to, you don't put in more, you take away. Usually when something doesn't work, it's because you're doing too much or you've made uh, the wrong choice. And I remember when I first, first started out as a cinematographer, the very first thing I was into is, is there enough light? So I light, and he said, but Denis, it's flat. And suddenly it opened my mind. Ah, light can be flat or not flat, and clearly flat is not good. A film is like, um, like in my tennis days, uh, my coach would say, you know, or people would say, keep your eye on the ball. Well, that's pretty easy to say, keep your eye on the ball. But I had one coach that said, keep your eye on a certain part of the ball. He put a face on the ball, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and, when you, and, and two ears. And if you hit right on the nose, it just goes flat if you hit underneath. Anyway, so it's not a question to keep your eye on the ball. It's, it's a question of the part of the ball. It's the same thing with the screen. When you look at the screen, you have your imagery. It's not just to look at the screen. You've got to make the audience look at some part of that screen that's important, where the dialogue is going on. And so it's precision. In a sense, it's precision lighting. 
Rule of thumb, if I'm lighting for several actresses in, in a large space, is to go with two 12 by 12 layers of full or half grid, and then maybe a four by four layer of 216 in front of a large light. And uh, uh, start there, and then, but what's very important is exactly the direction that that light is coming from. Even though it may be a, a large soft source, uh, the difference of a foot or two, either closer to the camera or away from the camera, can make all the difference in the world. And that's the thing, you have to, you have to really look at the scene, how it's being re rehearsed, and go, wow, this is great for this actress when she's looking this way, but when we come around, uh, or she turns this way, we run into trouble. I personally uh, don't like the soft lighting too much because many, many times it gets boring, actually, for me. It's, uh, it, it, I mean, I, I, I study a lot of paintings from uh, the Dutch painters and all that. They hardly ever used, actually, soft light, actually. They used a lot of directional light, which I love to use. Backlight was used in painting for centuries, but on film, it had been, in the silent days, the characteristic of just using front front light, soft light or, or direct front light. And Mary Pickford was photographed by, I think, Billy Bitzer at a, at a, at a lunch break in backlight with her curls of flame. And that came up at dailies and it, it changed history. I think that a single gesture coming from a single side is powerful. If you put a light on the other side, it weakens it. Now the force of that light is not as strong. So this is a, what we call a flag, and uh, if we're on a set, we would do something like try to bring in a black flag that would take away some of the light. So we're not completely surrounded by light from several directions. We try to bring it from uh, one direction, and that gives us a sense of richness and, uh, uh, and uh, texture and, uh, and mood, as opposed to what that looks like. I think, as a look. I think uh, good cinematographers uh, don't really use light, actually. They use shadows, because the light is creating shadows. And then I would like to insist on that, you know, the shadows are more important than the light is. We're always working against that. Is there enough? And of course, with time, once we master the quantity, then we start to deal with the quality. Control the light. Having figured out when you put a light up, how are you going to control it? Whether it be grip nets, dimmers, uh, diffusion on the light itself. In the hunt for sometimes that specific kind of light that just does that particular thing, you find uh, you know, technology to be on your side because either other people have already ventured out in that and have created a tool, or you go out on yourself and you start creating stuff. Here's a Kino flow here. This is a four foot tube and everything. And it's light, it's small, you can, it's fast. It's like, it, and it's a beautiful quality light. You, can, you don't have to diffuse it. Something that changed uh, cinematography was the Kino flow. I mean, that to me is just, all of a sudden practical locations uh, were something that were embraced even more so. And, and ceilings went back onto sets. And, and, no, and people weren't flying them anymore, and you saw less, you know, unnatural backlights, and lighting changed. I think it, it, people were able to put a light that didn't have to travel to create softness three feet away from a person, and all of a sudden you had this uh, quality of light that looked very natural. Well, of course, the Moscow light and the, uh, the nine light arrays that are out today have changed things for us, because now we can light uh, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks with just several uh, instruments. This is a blonde. Uh, it should be yellow. Yaniro, the original Yaniro uh, blonde is yellow. That's why it's called blonde. Like the redhead is red. That's why it's called redhead. Uh, this one is another brand, so it's blue. Uh, it's an open face uh, with a quartz uh, 2K uh, bulb and uh, barn doors, folding barn, door, barn doors on the side. That's uh, cool. And the great thing, it's not a, here, the, the gaffers, they just hate it. Uh, because for them, it does nothing well. And us, we love it because it does everything. Not so well, maybe, but everything. Nothing does everything. I guess my favorite form of lighting is, you know, put a 100-watt bulb in a lamp and turn it on. You know, if it's close enough to the actor, great. You know, I think that's, that's really terrific. You know, I, I like that. So turn off the key light a second. See, I like that, you know. This is good for something like that. 
but this is really the best. No light at all. The, uh, the back edge and a little bit of fill um, worked perfectly for that film. Not only did it give the beautiful edge that you imagine from old black and white stills on, that w appeared in jazz magazines like Downbeat, jazz magazine, a, a bebop magazine, wonderful old stills with beautiful edge light because the photographers had to go, had to find wherever there was light to get their imagery so they would use that edge light. And um, so that became my um, sort of template for all, the, all of Bird. A lot of films, uh, when you get started, they seem to have a life of their own, and sometimes your plans don't quite work out, but at least you start with a, an idea in mind and try to pursue it through the film. We were looking for this big finale on Chicago, and, you know, we sort of came up, you know, in our sort of discussions of this sort of idea of this big light board, you know, this, that filled the stage and would come on and sort of explode, explosion of light, and then they would sort of machine gun out the, you know, their names. I guess you light with your best instincts, you build in some flexibility into the rigging so that if you want to make changes, it's, it's there available to you. There was with about, you know, only about 500 light bulbs in the board and three guys screwing them in. And, um, and one thing we had unfortunately overlooked is that it took three days for these three guys to screw in 10,000 light bulbs. A cinematographer not only has to be a scientist and an artist, but they, they have to be a manager and a politician and, and a, a people person. And the, the your greatest gift to an actor or an actress is to create a comfortable arena for them to, to be stellar, to do their best work. And if they feel like they're cared for by the cinematographer, their work is indeed going to be better. They're going to take bigger risks than they might if they felt that they weren't being watched after by the cinematographer. Many, many years ago, right after I'd become a cameraman, a very famous cameraman at that time was named Charlie Lang. And Charlie was talking to me one day and he said, uh, there's two things I'd like to tell you, Fred. He said, save your money, but surround yourself with a good crew. It's not realized by the general public, but a focus puller you know, has a tremendous influence on the look of a film. And he has, a, has to do something that's quite athletic and graceful and artistic. And it's really not well known. It's just because of the name is focus puller or assistant camera. It doesn't really give, lend you know, full weight to what that person is doing. With a good gaffer sitting right over your right shoulder, you can whisper during rehearsals or whatever. Or, and, and a good gaffer would be there knowing your situation, that you, you're not able to, um, to work whilst rehearsing or whatever quietly in the background. When you work year after year and month after month and the kind of hours we work on a set and long locations and you, you're with your crew really more than you are your family, which is a shame, but that's just the way it worked out. But the strange part of it is your crew becomes your family um, and hopefully you all get along because you're there for extended periods of time. My ma management style is basically admiration. I find people, gaffers, uh, first assistants, camera operators, the key grips that, that, that I just love and admire, and I, I go to work with those people. Cinematography is the uh, mastering of a, of a complex technology in, in the service of art. And a lot of people think that, that if you're a cinematographer, uh, that you're more of a technician than you are an artist, but I would I would say that uh, you're more an artist than you are a technician because the uh, technology serves what the ideas are and how they're filtered through your mind. I can say that I've always been the type of person that, or the type of DP who's always approached the subject matter first with my heart. I first have approached it as someone who wants to tell a particular story and how can the technology help me to tell that story. I think the great challenge for us as cinematographers is, is, is moving into technology um, and I think that, that it's scary for all of us, there's no one that's not scared by it. It's hard to keep pace with such changing technology. A piece of film is moved through the camera and it's exposed and it goes to the laboratory and if you have light and a lens and you can um, look at that image almost anywhere in the world. It's amazing that that little machine can create so much magic 
and is the basis of an art form that has more power and influence than any other art form ever invented. The cameras are so much smaller now that they're much easier to use. I mean, you can get them into places that we, we could never have got a camera into 10, 15 years ago. Um, they're very light, um, they're perfectly balanced, um, if you want to go handheld. The new wave uh, people were um, freed by their small camera that they could hand hold and run around Paris with. And it's important to know the tool. And the best way to know the tool is when you carry that tool for eight hours walking in the, in the field. So the camera is part of you. But to be able to actually have the camera in my hand, looking at an actor and seeing them talk and knowing that that's the way it's going to be on the screen, seeing and hearing at the same time, and to, to feel feel our, the power. I often think of myself as an actor. I mean, I'm the person who stands up on my feet with the actors day to day and walks around them. If you have a camera on your shoulder enough and you're shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, you, I found that I developed a, a second sense about where people were going to move and where the best place to be was. Cameras, you know, I, <laughs> they'll hate me for saying it, but cameras don't matter to me. <laughs> I think that uh, it's the lenses. And I've said for years that a camera is just a light-type box with a lens on the end. Well, I, I've got a very strong feeling about lenses. And personally, I'm sitting here talking to you, and you're filming me from over there on a shoulder on a probably a single, where I'd rarely do that, because I think, you know, the camera wants to be... To me, I would shoot singles inside here, unless it's for a particular fact, and then I'd drop back off and be more observational with a shoulder in. I mean, I think it's a totally different effect to an audience looking at somebody on the end of a 100 millimeter lens, uh, as opposed to some, somebody that's being, being shot on a 27, close to, or 21. So here we are, 32 mil or 30 millimeter. It's on a zoom, so sometimes you can't tell what the millimeter is. Anyway, but um, it's different, right? You know, it's a sense of presence. You're right there with somebody, as opposed to being, it's, I think psychologically, it's a totally different effect. So. The psychology of, of lenses is that a wide-angle lens has a different effect than a telephoto lens. And um, so, for example, wide-angle, in many different ways, one of them, how the face is rendered, um, also a sense of action, like if I bring my hand closer or further from the camera, the wide-angle lens is going to have much more effect than it does. And even if I'm shifting like this, it's going to feel more live, more edgy, than it would with a telephoto lens. I mean, it's just the, the, the same as your relationship in real life to somebody. I'm sitting this close to you. I'm not, I'm not seeing you from over there on a long lens, you know. Uh, so I, I don't think we take that into account as much as we should, really. With all of these tools available to us, the question is what, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you find a great piece of equipment and modify a shot to suit that piece of equipment, or do you uh, figure out what you want to do and find the right piece of equipment. I'd never like to hear someone say, we can't do it, because you can always find a way to do it. And if it requires different technology or a different, uh, maybe even a different uh, member or two on the crew, that's what you have to do. I love mechanics. I mean, in the business, I was always going home, there's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be an easier way. Uh, I made the hi-hat because, you know, a hi-hat on a board is 1930s technology, and I bet you you still got one on the stage here. Ron Dexter is an amazing person. The thing that, one of the most important things I learned from him is you never have to accept the equipment as built by the manufacturer. What I did was I got outside of the movie industry. How do other people do things? I looked at catalogs. I'd bounce things off of people and uh, uh, found incredible tools that other industries use it, why aren't we? I can distinctly remember to this day him bringing home a 2C body that he had just bought, walking over to the bandsaw and cutting it in half. You had to saw off part of the lens to mount, put a different mount on it. I take the, whatever the simplest tool is to get the job done approach. Um, if we can do the shot static, then it's on sticks. If we need to move the camera, hopefully we can do it on a dolly. If it's got to go upstairs, then it might be a steady cam. And if it's going to make a huge rise, it'll be a crane. But to try to keep it as simple as possible, I find works the best for me. Every piece of new technology uh, inspires ideas. 
film stocks have uh, have been the thing for me that have, have sort of shaped the way films look today. As the digital world is coming towards us, the film keeps getting better. So the bar, you know, one raises the bar that the other one needs to come to meet. Film is is has much more resolution uh, buried in it than, uh, than a 1K, a 2K, or a 4K scan. When you would go to release a motion picture film, there, there's a process called color timing, and when you sit down to do that, that has not changed basically since the advent of, you know, color film when Calmus came up with Technicolor. Uh, and essentially you sit there and you hold different color pieces of gelatin in front of your eye and you say, do you like this yellow one? No, no. Let me see the green one. Hey, here's a yellow and a green. Or, hey, try this magenta. And you try to get the color balance right. I think everybody now has probably played with Photoshop or something like that. And these computers are incredibly powerful tools in terms of doing very subtle color correcting. I would say that traditionally film timing is compared to digital, what we call a digital intermediate or digital color correcting, is much cruder. It's just like printing, printing a still photograph. The, the great photographers like Ansel Adams, part of what they did in creating their images was the negative and the second part was the print. And the print was where it all came together. In this uh, world of digital intermediate where that's becoming more common, there's going to be a lot of choices uh, to be made, a lot of variables. There's in t an interpretation that has to carry from what the photography, the original intent is. It's like when those people in the, at, the beginning, at the beginning of filmmaking used to hand paint their frames. We, each, one, each, one, each one they used to hand paint it in order to give it a personal look. So by, oh, by us going into the digital bay, but by us uh, using digital intermediate, we are hand painting our films, and that is going to make our 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 art still to preserve, and it's going to give each one of us a look, which is, I think is very very important that we preserve. The danger is that the role of the cinematographer is much more vulnerable now. If you're not available six months, nine months, a year after you finish shooting, when the the studio or whoever's making the film is ready to do the digital intermediate, you got a problem. The downside is any technology that gives you sort of endless options also gives you endless options to screw up the image or have other people take over the image. So it becomes much more important for the cinematographer to exert some control over the post-production process. Before, with traditional film printing, there was limitations on how much you could change the image or reformat the image or reframe the image without affecting the quality. So the cinematographer could rely in the sense of the limitations of the technology to keep the image close to what he intended. But now with digital intermediate, that's not the case. He could turn the movie into a completely different looking image. The advantage is that you only have to do your work once. Um, you can take this digital intermediate and and port it over to your uh, HD mastering for, for DVD and for all other uses and not have to do the work twice again. And this is a great boon. Which with all, the, with all the pressures on all of us to do more, faster, cheaper, this is a tool which helps us. There's companies that are out there and they're doing everything they can to bring in the jobs for us to shoot the commercials and music videos, but at the same time, the economy is tight so that their, their profit margins are being cut closer and closer. So we're always trying to find things that as well as advancing the art, that will also advance, this, this let us do it quicker. The movie industry is, is this is wonderful combination of high finance and, and art. That's what a cinematographer has to do, all filmmakers do. When you show up, you have to look at uh, your restraints as uh, an opportunity. Every time I see a new piece of equipment, I look at it in, in envy, and I, I say, would well, you wish somebody let me have this for Christmas for my next film? Well, I tell a story. The first day we were shooting on Barton Fink, I have the story, but I'm really nervous. I mean, I think the guys were great filmmakers, so I was so pleased to be working with them, and in America, and I hadn't been here really much by then. And anyway, so I had the sort of storyboards for the day, I think. And I got, and uh, in prep, I went up to Joel, I said, well, you know these shots, what? We, were on that. we were looking at the location, we were in a theatre downtown, and they had a series of shots going around this stage. And I said, well, what a Joel, what if, you know, we could combine these and do a moving camera shot and combine five storyboards in one. And he said, oh, well, okay, yeah, that would be great. So we got a Lumar crane in, it was about the only time I used it, I think, and, and did, this, did this little shot. 
instead of five shots, it was one fluid thing. It's the opening of the, the movie. And so what I love about working with them is they have this very um, thought-out idea of what they want, how they want to cover things, the sort of feel of the movie. But then they're really open to ideas. And that was the first day I worked with them. So they had this, they had this day's work laid out in this theatre. We wrapped at 12 o'clock, you know, in the morning, I mean, midday, because we'd done this Lumar crane shot, and that was it. We had nothing else to do. I think people fall in love with the process, you know, and equipment, and the process is a means to an end. I mean, a camera's a tool. You know, film's a tool. I'm a tool. The actor's a tool. The director's a tool. You know, and the whole thing is to move that script onto the screen. The thing about tools and technology is it's how you use them that makes us different. It's the ideas in your head and the, the vision that you have. And it's like uh, paintbrushes. You have one uh, a big brush, half an inch, two inch, a quarter of an inch. That's what technology today, that's how I use it as new tools. The relationship between technology and style is a kind of dialectic. Really, technology does release you to do new shots, new angles, new, new movements, but you have to decide why you're doing them, not because you can, but because you should. And I think that's the key to, to the use of technology. You can have all kinds of ideas on what you want to achieve, but if you don't know your craft, if you don't know how to use your tools, you'll never be able to get those ideas across. So you have to master that part of it. And part of that, the tools are the cameras, the lenses, the film stock, the lights, the type of lighting you're gonna do, um, exposure, the lab work, it's all part of it. Well, for every artist, no matter what the art form they're dealing in, the technology is the servant of the artist. Um, it could be cave painting in uh, southern France 17,000 years ago. The technology of creating dyes and pigments to uh, scratch images on the cave wall was the technology that the artists used to create those images. When I was a child, I used to, uh, of, in Brittany, I used to run to, to, to get a kick by running on, on stones, uh, which were uh, by the sea and moving all of them. And the fun was to to, to choose by with you, the, your eye uh, on which stone put your foot and that you were already uh, gone. But if the stone was a bad stone or because you had the bare, you were barefooted, uh, it would be hurt and all that. And, it, and in filming is a little like that. Filming is always running forward, looking for not losing your balance and, um, and having a lot of fun from this kind of adrenal, uh, yes, adrenaline shot that we're having on the sets all the time. In our lifetime, we've already gone through uh, major changes in, in, in technology, technique, um, black and white, color negative, reversal. Uh, not to mention from silent to sound. And I think those, those changes, far, to me, far more greater than the change that we're facing at the moment, which is from film to digital uh, medium. I think cinematography hasn't changed, but it might require a new cinematographer one who's versed in digital technology and fearless and able to assert the, the, the view, the, the vision as, as the cinematographer traditionally has done on the set, is also to command the process through the end so that the look creation doesn't es escape the cinematographer. I think all of the techniques, all of the tools, all of the new materials that, are, that allow us to make images, no matter what they are, whether they're digital, whether they're film, um, or, or whether they're, you know, we're, we're shooting on, on tissue paper, it doesn't matter. What, what is important is that the cinematographer is needed from the beginning of the production till the end of the production. And not until a film gets on the screen is when the cinematographers work work over. I think what has mattered to me in my career is uh, the times that I really uh, thought that I really hit the mark was when I closed my mind to all the technique and the technology and listened to my heart and my soul. And then the answer came just like that. We create our own vision, we get to put it on film, we get to show it to the world. I've always felt that one of the greatest gifts of uh, mankind is not the opposable thumb, which has given us technology in our society, but the ability to tell story. At the very beginning, we, we create fire, light sources, and we create shadows. 
we need to make images. It, it's not really a thing we choose to do. It's something we need to do. We've always needed to do this. We've always needed to create images. Um, before there were words, there were images. Before there were numbers, there were images. There were drawings on caves. That's how, that's how deep our drive to do this is. It's interesting because the images they created with flickering light in a darkened cave is not dissimilar to the images we create with flickering lights in a darkened theater. The future is in us telling stories with pictures. But there is only one thing that never change, the idea. The idea doesn't matter if you do on, on, on stone, on, on, on wood, on canvas, on films, or in electronic, the idea is the one that really stay, always, because it's energy, because it's part of ourself. It's the idea that is important. It's why you do something as opposed to how you do something. What you do and why you do it. If the emphasis remains on good storytelling visually, then there's great work to be seen in the future with no limits as to what the image could conjure up. Um, so I think we're in for a good ride.